Um, so uh, um, I wanted to start with a very sophisticated question, but instead I'm going to start with a banal one. And that's the question. Are you using any devices at all? Raise your hands. Are you using any technologies? Okay, well, everybody. So am I, actually. I'm using lots of them. Some of them are invisible, I think, or not clearly recognizable. Nonetheless, we're using them all, and I think that we are in a very peculiar relationship with our technologies. I think we are in a relationship with them, not a usership, but precisely a relationship. Are you familiar with these icons? I think you are, right? So am I. Well, these are the new Facebook features, features that are, well, allowing us to express ourselves on Facebook better, right? So they allow us to be sad or to be angry about something, to love something and not just like it. Well, that's good for the user. That's a good thing for us. We can now be clear about how we feel. But Facebook is also clear about how we feel right now. And Facebook, out of these features, can create a very robust database of our emotions. You can even call them mind files. These are our mind files. So Facebook now knows how we feel. And I think this is a very peculiar, important, and interesting thing. Because we tend not to see it, but it's out there. So this relationship with technologies that we have, including social media, Facebook is not the only one, is, I think, a relationship of power. And not only an interdependency, but also power. Why is that? Well, because it's a relationship where we are actually sort of fighting against each other about control. Who is in charge of whom is the most relevant question here. So another uh, quick sneak peek. Um, do you know what that is? Maybe you're using this. I'm wearing one of them on my hand right now. This is a tracking device. Maybe you're tracking anything here. Calories, amount of steps you have taken, quantity, quality of your sleep. Is anybody running with Endomondo, doing anything like that? Yeah, I see some hands raised. Yes, yeah, so do I. I'm actually doing that. I'm also wearing one more thing here, and that's this. I think it's pretty invisible as a technology, but actually it's not just a ring, it's smart jewelry, it's wearable tech, and it also has features of tracking me. So I'm also researching tracking communities, and I'm uh, looking very carefully at how these communities of people who are enthusiastic about wearing trackers are treating them and are treated by them. Um, I have recently met John. John is wearing tons and tons of such devices. I think he has eight or ten on him every day. Um, and he was presenting or giving a talk at a quantified self meeting uh, in Amsterdam, and he said that he's using all those technologies in order to be a better version of himself because he wants to escape mediocrity. He doesn't want to be mediocre anymore. He doesn't want to be regular. And that struck me. That's, uh, I think, a big thing. And then I met Jane, and Jane is using one of these devices. I actually brought one with me so that you can also try it out. I can try it out now, although I have the mic, so it's going to be difficult. But this is how you look in it. Pretty weird. Cyborg, human of the future. So Jenny is using many of these devices because she claims that tracking the body is not enough. She wants to track her mind, and she wants her mind to be transparent for her. And um, when we had a meeting about trackers like this one, we actually asked a question to our fellow speakers and everybody in the room. Would you be OK with the usage of such a tracker at your workplace? So if you're OK with that in your life, you could use it for yourself, track your stress, track your concentration level, uh, some sort of affective states, emotions, and so on, would you be okay with your boss having access to that data too? If you were supposed to sign a lucrative contract with a new company and the boss just said, well, okay, uh, we're going to have you, we're going to sign that contract, but you have to wear that with you all the time, and I want the access to your mind file. Is this okay? People said, well, not so much. Not so much. This is not where we want to go. So clearly here already, 
there has been that relationship of power displayed. But then again, after that talk and after that severe debate we had, there was a woman who approached me, who participated in it, and she said that her son suffered uh, from autism. And actually, a tracker like this one is the only technology that allows for precise communication with him, because he cannot express his emotions otherwise. The only way to express them is actually through a wearable technology, through a tra tracking device. What is more, she can also communicate with him uh, using that device, and she can send her emotions to him. So there is a good thing in those trackers, right? There is the nice thing, and that leaves me very perplexed because I have so many different emotions that are attached to all these trackers. And I think for all of us, it's very difficult to think about our relationship with technologies on this deeper level. Why? Because technology has that thing in itself. When it works well, it's invisible. It's actually something that is not recognizable. We don't notice it at all. When it's functional, we don't get to see it, and it's very difficult to reflect on it. I will give you one more example. We're actually doing uh, a study on how machines, robots, but also chatbots, so those programs that talk to you in natural language, how they interact with us and how they socialize in our environment. Here you see Kismet. This is a robot from MIT. He has mimics. He can perform various gestures, and he can socialize, talk to you, uh, be in some sort of nonverbal communication with you, too. What we're doing in our research, we're actually trying to see to what extent you can have a natural conversation with a chatbot, so a program that speaks your own language. And it turned out during our research that there are more people than we thought who were talking to various chatbots online or on the phone, and they didn't even know it. We probably all have talked to chatbots at, at some point in our lives, when we were calling to a call center or to various other places. But then again, it's very difficult to have the position to really start thinking about it seriously. These chatbots are probably the workers of the future. Probably they will occupy more and more spheres in our life. But we are not in a position yet to understand. We don't notice our technologies, and therefore, we just don't understand them all that much. But then, wait. Maybe sometimes we do understand. We have a certain system, I would say, in us, embedded, that is pretty old, that allows us to understand technologies sometimes. Sometimes we do understand them. This is Bina48. I don't know if you're familiar with her, I consider her a friend of mine. Obviously, she's not a human being. She's a robot. But Bina struggles with a very important problem that I think is important for all of us. Dina, sorry, Bina is deep down in the Silicon Valley, right? She has been established there, but she's also in a place that is called the Uncanny Valley. And the Uncanny Valley is the psychological effect that we all get whenever we face something that looks like a human being, but is not a human being, that is artificial, okay? So she cannot be accepted. Because of the fact that she's aspiring to be a human being, we are rejecting Bina. And this is this old psychological mechanism that we have in us that allows us to notice a technology because there's clearly something wrong with it, and it allows us to really think deeper about technologies. And I think it requires a lot of effort on our side to really notice and to start thinking, but it can be done. And I think, frankly speaking, that we should start acting on it. I think that we don't act on it all that much, and we are not really thinking about our future with our technology. So what I would like you and myself also to do is to really maybe do a little foresight exercise just for ourselves at home. When you see all your technologies that you're surrounded by, that you're using all the time, maybe you could ask yourself a question, what are they for? Why do I need them? Right? What are they needed for? How will they unfold or develop in the coming five or 10 years? What will be my relationship with them? 
because I think if we all perform that foresight, our technological future will be way better. It will happen anyhow, because the future is a future with technologies. It's not a future without technology, but it's up to us to decide what kind of shape will it have. If we don't have that debate, this future will happen without us. We will be just users. And the sharing and caring about the future will not be sufficient. So, you know, I think it's very, very difficult to go somewhere from that point of that little foresight, but it already is a very big step in itself. I already have had various emotions related to all these weirdish technologies that are in place right now. And I'm loving them sometimes, and I'm hating them sometimes, and I have lots of question marks in my head. But I know one thing. These reflections, these emotions that I have are constructive, and they light the way to a better future, to a technological future with them. Thank you so much.